Good morning, everybody. It's a good Saturday morning, not Sunday morning, so I'm happy about that and happy that um, you guys dragged yourself over here from uh, wherever you were last night. Um, so for some of you may not realize it is the next morning. And uh, I'm going to talk today about um, hardware hacking and the law. Um, I'm Jennifer Granick. I'm the Civil Liberties Director at the Electronic Frontier Foundation. And my um, colleague Matt Zimmerman is here with me today, and he's going to um, talk about these issues as well. So I'm just going to give a little bit of an introduction. I think you guys all know what EFF is, I hope. I see some people with our shirts on. Thank you very much. Um, and the kinds of work that we do at EFF. Um, you know, in this area having to do with computer security and coders and programmers and hackers and then also all of our free speech and intellectual property work and privacy work that we do. So um, if you have interest in EFF and you don't know about us, you can visit our website. And what I'm going to talk about today, this morning, is hardware hacking and um, the special kind of legal regimes that relate to hardware hacking. And I'm going to talk specifically about the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, the rulemaking that happens under the Copyright Act, and how EFF won exemptions from uh, enforcing that law against people who unlock or jailbreak their phones people who make non-commercial videos, and then I'll talk about, um, about um, Professor Halderman's security exemption that he won for looking at video games, just because I think that that's something that this community of people might be interested in. So why have a talk that's particularly about hardware hacking as opposed to other kinds of hacking? Well, increasingly devices have embedded software in them, um, so that you know now we have everything, not just smartphones, but calculators, e-readers, and even cameras that have software in it. And the um, hacking that involves accessing embedded software raises special issues under the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, which is this crazy law that we'll discuss in detail. So there's these particular DMCA issues, but one of the um, basic things that relates to what your rights are with regards to hacking or reverse engineering embedded software are um, terms of service. And so I'm going to turn it over to Matt for a while to talk about terms of service and EULAs and um, what the law is there and how it affects your rights with regards to manipulating pieces of software. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, so to understand kind of the lay of the land, uh, to, to figure out your uh, potential liability uh, for hardware hacking and other related kind of uh, hacking activities. Uh, we have to understand the role that the use of end user license agreements, private contract, uh, terms of service play uh, into the, the potential liability realm. Uh, and uh, there, there have been a series of cases over the past few years that many of you have probably heard about uh, to some extent or another that really does kind of inform how we're, how we're you know, watching these issues uh, go forward and, and kind of mapping what, what direction, that, that what, what path it follows. Um, the first is the, the Lori Drew case um, that, again, is probably the, the most high profile of, of these cases. And the case had to do with uh, a woman who uh, put, a, put together a fake MySpace page uh, saying that she was a, a teenage boy who then entered into communications with the, the neighbor uh, girl, pretended to be someone who was interested uh, in this girl and kind of strung her along for a very long time and then turned on her and said that she was an awful person. And it, it's, a really, it's a really tragic story. The, the, the girl, uh, uh, in this case, ended up committing suicide. And the authorities were left with this kind of Bad, bad situation from their standpoint of not really having a, a legal regime, a, a law to apply to the to the situation. Nothing really kind of fits squarely. So someone had the the, the clever idea of using uh, the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, uh, which uh, limits uh, your ability to gain unauthorized access to remote computing networks. And so the theory was that because the MySpace terms of service banned uh, what. Uh, what this woman did, uh, creating f a fake profile, including uh, fake information, uh, including age information, that not only was that a violation of the terms of service, but that's actually a crime. Uh, and you can go to jail for that. 
Um, a jury convicted her uh, on, on this claim. Um, clearly, she was not a very sympathetic uh, figure. Uh, at the end of the day, the judge did what we think was the, was the right thing and ended up overturning that conviction, saying that, no, you, can, you know, this is not what the CFAA was created to do. It was more, it was about, you know, more, more you know, hardware-specific uh, you know, hacking crimes, not a, a way to turn this kind of private agreement between, uh, you know, private individuals into a way to impose to impose criminal liability. Um, but that that theory did kind of has kind of caught on and given given others, uh, in, especially in law enforcement, this bright idea um, that that's that's a way that we can can get after people who are who are violating uh, terms of service. Another case that we worked on is uh, the second one up there is this, the the Calixti case, uh, which had to do with a Boston College student who was uh, accused of sending emails on the Boston College uh, listserv, outing his roommate. The students had had a, a falling out uh, apparently, and they suspected him of. Of, of sending these emails. Um, I, I, this isn't directly on point, but I, I thought I would mention at least a couple of the things that are in the uh, in the uh, statement of probable cause that you that you might find interesting. Is these are these are bits of information that uh, given to the judge to let him so that the judge could decide whether there was probable cause that he might have committed this so-called crime. Um, a couple of things in there. Uh, Mr. Clixty was quote a computer science major who was considered a master of the trade among his peers. Clearly, you know you know, notorious behavior, uh, that Calixti had a reputation as a, quote, hacker, uh, that it is not, un that it is, quote, not uncommon for Mr. Calixti to appear with unknown laptop computers, which he says that are given to him by Boston College field testing, or, or that he is, quote, fixing, unquote, for other students, and that he, my favorite, that he uses two different operating systems to hide his illegal activities. One, one, is, the regular, one is the regular BC operating system, and the other is a black screen with white font, which he uses prompt commands on. So, <laughs> you know, so clearly. Yeah, for those of you who are in the probable cause talk yesterday, now you know. <laughs> it's, you know, they had him dead to rights. So, um, so they, it, was the, it was the same theory. Um, you know, a similar one to the, the Lori Drew case, um, go through all of that information in the probable cause statement and the theory was, well, there's some, there's some terms of service that he must have violated. They didn't, they didn't quite mention what it was and it could have been, say, the, the Yahoo terms of service that you, you know, can't use it for harassing purposes. And what they actually, what the police actually said when they ended up briefing this was like, well, at the time we sought the warrant, there, it was pretty reasonable to think that there was a, a terms of service somewhere that would have that would have barred this, and it probably would have, you know, violated violated that. Um, uh, we ended up taking that to the the Massachusetts Supreme Court, and they and the court thankfully ruled ruled in our favor. So it was kind of scaling back uh, that you know, that attempt to, to use the terms of service as a, uh, as a theory in that way. Um, there are two more recent cases uh, that have, have really given, given some momentum to this effort to, to discourage people from using this, using this theory. Uh, one is a U.S. versus uh, Lawson, uh, which is a case that we filed an amicus brief in uh, a few weeks ago, uh, has to do with uh, a ticket master uh, and individuals using automated uh, efforts to purchase tickets from Ticketmaster in violation of their terms of service. Again, the government's position is that well, you're, you know, violating the terms of service. This is clearly not. It's clearly not a, a tort. It's not a private it, it, uh, civil issue. It's actually a crime that you could that you could do time for. Uh, and uh, most recently, uh, the Facebook versus Power case, uh, similar technology, uh, Power developed a, a tool to aggregate to allow people to aggregate information across social networking sites. Uh, Facebook didn't like that uh, and uh, tried to raise the same kind of uh, Computer Fraud and Abuse Act uh, theory. Uh, just last week, uh, the court issued uh, a ruling saying that no, that that doesn't fly. That's not what the statute was was intended for. Um, this is not what author unauthorized use meant uh, under under the statute. So, so it seems like the law is at least moving in a in a good direction uh, on this point, even though can, people continue to to try to use this theory. Um, there, there, one aspect of the, the of both the Lawson and the Facebook cases that still raise some concerns, and that's the uh, that it ties into what I've been talking about um, already, and that is um, to the extent that sites use 
technological protection measures like CAPTCHAs or doing IP blocking and, the, and, the, and when you route around those efforts uh, to find, say, a way to automate a way around the CAPTCHAs or to change, you know, change your IP um, address when someone was clearly trying to block you specifically, um, how does that play into this, into this, uh, this legal regime? And the court in the Facebook case left open the possibility that uh, that you know if you knew if you circumvented an IP block that could actually mean that you've gained unauthorized access to the system whereas just the generalized terms of service violation may not may not impose liability doing doing something else above and beyond that may may very well impose impose liability and that that issue is still still live in the in the Lawson case so um, so this all cut to come full circle all becomes important um, it's not just simply relevant for website uh, usage, it's, it, it implicates really what happens when someone slaps a terms of service on their product, um, not only their service, but their product. Their, you know, their, can, can someone add a, add a license agreement to their product saying that you know, you're not allowed to you know, do X, Y, and Z, and can, can you not only find yourself in trouble when, if they sue you, but can you, can you also find yourself in jail? So I'd be interested just generally in what people think about that circumvention issue because we've tried to, you can see what we said about it in the Facebook case and in the uh, Lawson case where we discussed the questions of what kind of technological measures are when circumvented equal unauthorized access. Um, so, so these licensing issues really matter when you have hardware hacking because the software, the embedded software will come with some kind of license usually. And that um, license seeks to condition how much you can use the, and what you can do with the software. And those licenses are generally considered to be enforceable even when they have terms that prohibit reverse engineering and those sorts of things. Um, and the licenses often will say that you're not the owner of the copy of the software, that the copy of the software is actually just lent to you and that um, the ownership rights remain with the remain with the company and all of that implicates what your rights to do um, security testing or reverse engineering are under the copyright law so I'm going to talk a bit about the copyright law about the MCA and uh, show you some of the problems with this law and then talk a bit about the rulemaking and how we got around some of these things so there's, when we talk about the DM, when we lawyers talk about the DMCA, usually we're talking about one of two provisions. There's the safe harbor provisions under Section 512, and there's the anti-circumvention provisions under Section 1201. And so I'm talking about the 1201 provisions, which are the ones that I think are so fascinating. And when Congress went through and um, passed this law, I think the idea behind it was that it was going to be a law that says that you cannot break technological locks that protect copyrighted works. And the idea was to, first of all, first and foremost, to prevent digital pri piracy of um, particularly DVDs and music and that sort of thing. Um, but also there's this idea that it enables new business models because um, companies can control the way you get to the work. So even when it has nothing to do with infringement necessarily, um, it, if you could have protection, legal protection for things like for, for different uh, technological protection measures, TPMs, you could have streaming or you could have leasing of music, digital music and that kind of thing. So. This, the law is structured to have two basic prohibitions. One is a prohibition against the act of circumvention, and the other is a prohibition against the distribution of tools which are used for circumvention. Um, and these are all terms of art under the statute, um, but I think you get the basic idea is that a technological protection measure, TPM, is something that controls access to the work. It doesn't control top copying. We're not talking about something that prevents infringement. We're talking about something that controls the way you use um, or access the work. People at this point usually raise their hand and they ask me, what's effectively mean in the terms of the statute? Effectively does not mean that it is, in fact, effective. It means, in effect, <laughs> that's what it's trying to do. So so obviously, I mean, I guess I kind of think that makes sense because if it were, if the t TPM were so effective, then probably it wouldn't be so darn easy to hack. Um, so the tools provision um, basically says that you cannot traffic and distribute tools that are primarily designed, valuable, or marketed for circumvention of a TPM that controls access to a copyrighted work. So, acts and tools. 
What kind of things are TPMs? And you guys can think of these, whether it's DVD encryption, code signing, obfuscation, maybe protocol encryption. There's a bunch of things that, are, that could potentially be TPMs. And then the question that courts look to when trying to decide if this is something that you are or are not allowed to circumvent is what effect does the TPM have? How does it govern the, the work? Uh, and the statute has a bunch of exceptions to it that are built into the statute. Uh, the three that I think are most relevant to what you guys do are the uh, exception for reverse engineering, the exception for security testing, and the exception for encryption research. I don't want to talk too, too much about the parameters of the exception, but I wanted to give you guys some uh,